Hi, and welcome to the Church Unlimited podcast. Church Unlimited is a vibrant, Bible-based church in North Lakes, Queensland that is passionate about helping people discover the genuine love of Jesus. If you're currently looking for a home church, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. For more information about our Sunday service or to find out how we can best help you, head to our website at churchunlimited.com.au. We hope you enjoy this message from Sunday service. Hey, I'm really excited to to bring the word this morning on Mother's Day. Uh, We're continuing on uh, the series that we began last week on living free. Because I I genuinely believe that as believers, not only do we need to understand the freedom that Jesus has won for every single one of us, but I think we need to learn how to step into that freedom that he's purchased. We need to learn how to live free. You know, from the very beginning, Jesus said his ministry was that he came to set the captives free, free from sin, free from the the brokenness and the, the decay that exists around us, free from the oppression of the devil. When he describes life, uh, this is how he described the world. He said that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came that we could have life and live it to the full. In John 8, 36, he said, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. You know, Jesus gave his life so that every single one of us could live free. He purchased our freedom at an incredible cost. Wouldn't it be a shame if we, his church and his people, the ones that he gave his life for didn't choose to actually walk in the freedom that he'd won for us. If we didn't choose to live in the freedom that he'd purchased, it's been bought, it's been bought, it's been paid for. Everything is done and it's readily available. What a tragedy if we didn't step into it today. You know, I'm confronted by the idea that far too many believers whilst they live with faith in Jesus Christ fail to live in and experience the freedom and the abundant life that he intends for us. Not because we don't want it, but rather because I think we don't see the chains that might hold us captive. Because from the the very moment that we were born, I think each of us has lived in a world that's been impacted by sin, a world that's been tainted by brokenness. We've not actually known anything else. I think it's, it's created or it's nurtured within us Patterns of greed and pride. Cycles of hurt and hurting others. Do you know offense and unforgiveness in our world are normal? Anger and hate in our world is normal. Divorce is normal. Sickness is normal. Anxiety, depression, these things are all, they're normal. And I fear that too many believers today live held captive in these things because they believe that it's normal not knowing that in Jesus Christ, every single one of us has been set free. You know, I think the the devil often tries to hold believers, Christians, captive. Exactly the same way that you would teach a baby elephant to remain captive. Have you ever seen elephants? Um, It's probably a little bit too politically correct these days, but if you looked in the past where there was elephants at circuses, um, you would see a large elephant held by a small rope with a tent peg in the ground. And that elephant would remain in its place because it was held by this rope. Now, how does such an an incredibly large, powerful animal, how is it held in place by such a small rope and a small peg? Well, it's grown up with that peg around its, with that rope around its foot and it's been pegged into the ground from the moment that it was a small child. Small elephant? I'm looking at my own small child right now. I won't draw the... From the moment that elephant was a baby... It's not known anything different. It's been held in place by a rope that when it was small was strong enough to keep it within that area. But as it grew, did they have to make a larger rope and a bigger pen? Did they have to start to hold it more firmly in the ground? No. I mean, how big a rope would you actually need to fix an elephant in one place? It doesn't matter because that elephant doesn't need a larger rope because it's never known anything different. That elephant is held in place by a small rope because it believes that it can't get free of it. If only it knew the strength that it possessed right now. 
if only it knew that it could simply step out of that limitation and roam free. Jesus came to set us free from the normal that we live in. But too often, because we've never seen anything different, because we've never known anything different, we don't know that in Christ we can now live free of the sin that would hold us. You know, last week we looked at the story of Israel as God was leading them out of captivity from Egypt. And in this story of their captivity, we see actually some strategies that the devil would use to outwork his hold on the people of God. And we see his four-part plan that he uses to hold captive God's children. And would you believe it? That guy is still doing the same thing today. As we see it, as we learn to recognize it, we're actually able to then learn how to step free of it. Let me give you a quick recap of what the the devil would do to try and hold captive God's children today. Well, firstly, he'd lie to us about our identity, telling us that we're not children of God, that we're slaves held captive in his world. Secondly, he'd burden us with heavy work. Now, it might not be your job, but it might be a sense of need to prove yourself or to earn people's love or to be validated. It might be a need to do everything in your own strength and not his. But he burdens us with the sense of labor. Not only that, as a result of this, he steals our joy. He steals our hope. He steals our future, telling us it will never be any different than it is right now. And he, he puts spiritual oppression on our life. He puts slave, slave drivers or taskmasters that would stand there and say, at the moment I see anybody looking like they want to live free, well, let me oppress them. Let me hold them down. Let me tell them that they will never be anything other than submitted to my authority. That's the work that the devil would do in our life today. But in Christ, we can walk in freedom as we, my four-part response, find out who I am in God, learning to live according to his truth. As I set aside the burdens of the, wo- of the world and learn to live in worship of God. As I find healing and restoration and peace, resting in his presence. As I learn to stand in God's strength, not my own. I think it's so important for every single one of us. Because no one wants to live held captive, right? Nobody wants to live a life that's held captive by sin, held captive by the devil, held captive by the world around us. Every single one of us wants to live free. And if you want to, why don't you go back and, if you weren't here last week, go and listen on YouTube. You'll see that, that sermon talking about how we as believers can live free. But also today I want to challenge you because the freedom that we live, we find, is actually so much bigger than just us. We need to live free because our freedom impacts more than just myself. As we live free, we benefit the world around us. We benefit the, the, our family, our workplace, our friends. Do you know, as we learn to live free, we can literally change the world around us. You know, Dr. Jordan Peterson would say if you, that if you want to make the world a better place... Start by making your bed, because small victories will lead to great progress. It's good advice. I hope you made your bed this morning. But I want to tell you, mm, on Mother's Day, on Mother's Day, but here, I want to tell you, if you really want to make the world a better place, start by living in the life Christ called you to. It's as you learn to walk in freedom that you're actually able to lead others into that same freedom as well. It's not even that you'll have to try to do it. They'll just see it on your life and start to follow after it. I think when Christians, when believers learn to step outside of what's normal for our world, people around them are encouraged, inspired, and believe that they could live the same life as well. What begins with one results in freedom for many. Not only will we prosper, but our friends will. Our family will. Your workplace will. The North Lakes community, Australia could prosper simply because you learned to live free. So if you want to make North Lakes a better place today, start by following Jesus just a little more closely. As you learn to follow him, as you learn to live free, you'll find abundant, overflowing life, and you'll help others to do the same. Do you know, as we learn to live free, not only does it change our life, not only does it change the world around us, but it actually brings God more glory as well. I was reminded of this idea just this week because yesterday, 
Uh, Joe was out at Raising Queens being pampered and I was at home with, well, she was pampering Penny. I wasn't invited. I don't really know what happened. But I was at home with Tessa, with Harry and with Oscar. And I thought, great opportunity. We'll just pop to the shops. We'll get a few last minute things, a gift for Joe. And we had a little shopping adventure. It was fine. There was no tears. It was good times. Everybody was happy. Later, Joe came home and she's like, oh, you went to the shops, did you? Just for this. I was like, yeah. She goes, and you took the children looking like that. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, they were not suitably attired for public consumption. <laughs> What's the problem? Children are a reflection of their parents. And I apparently had not taken my children out providing a good picture of what our parenting style truly is. <laughs> they didn't bring glory to their mother. <laughs> but could you imagine? That when you learn to live free, when you learn to live in the freedom that Christ has won for you, as you learn to find an abundant life, as you allow the Holy Spirit to transform you and teach you how to follow after Him, as you experience the goodness of God, as you live in His abundance and His prosperity, maybe it might just reflect well on your Heavenly Father. And that as we, the church, learn to step outside of the normal and into the promises of God, that it might bring him glory because our life is evidence of his goodness, that our life is evidence of his provision and his grace upon our life. As we learn to live in freedom, it doesn't just change our life right now. It actually is a great act of worship to our Father. Others will be blessed as well as they see his goodness and are drawn to him as well. So I think it's time for us as a church to lift our eyes and to start to actually live the life that Christ intends for us. But if last week was an instruction on how, I've got no four-part plan today. This week, I just want to inspire you with why. I want to show you five ways. Take that last week, there was only four. But I've got five ways that your life can be used by God to bless the world. Five ways that God wants to work through you to transform the world around you and lead others into freedom. And we're actually going to see these demonstrated just simply in the life of King David. You can read his story in the books of 1 and 2 Samuels and in Chronicles. He was the king of Israel that led, led Israel into what would be called its golden era. He was the greatest king of Israel and he was a man called a man after God's own heart. He knew what it was to live a life of faith and a life of freedom. And I want his life to inspire us today because everything that God did in the life of King David he would do in your life as well as you choose to follow after him. So my first very simple point today is this, that as you learn to live free, you will bring an atmosphere of peace to those who are close to you. As God want, does a work in your life, he wants to work through you to bring an atmosphere of peace to those around you. If you read in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 12, you'll see that David is has been living, he's been anointed as king, but now he's back living as a shepherd boy, guarding his father's flocks. And we know that during this time, as he was watching the herd, he would sit and he would play his harp and he would sing worship to the Lord. At the same time, King Saul, the king of Israel, has begun to be tormented, it says, by evil spirits. He sends for David, a known and skilled worshiper, send somebody to come that they would minister to me. And when David plays, Saul experiences peace. Let me read uh, chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. It says, And David came to Saul, he entered into his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. He, came, he became close to King Saul. And Saul sent Jesse and saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirits from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre, and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Let me ask you this question. What sort of atmosphere surrounds you each day? Some people, when you, when you bring them worry, oh, you just leave more worried. They amplify anxiety. They create more fear and concern. Others, no matter what you tell them, 
will just lead you to a place of peace and calm and trust. Some people create an atmosphere that stirs up animosity between friends, while others just have an ability to bring peace and unity between people. Some people describe what's happening around them. Others learn to prophesy the truth of the word of God into existence. Let me ask you again, what are you known for bringing into the room as you, as you approach? Because you carry the presence of God with you at all times. Would you allow him to lead you and guide you? Would you allow him to minister through him? Would you allow him to bring the fruit of his presence into the world around you? Would you choose to be like David? who offered up worship in the presence of oppression, knowing that as you lift up his name, there's no power or authority, no evil spirit, no work of the enemy, no lie that could stand against you. As you choose to live a life of worship, you can literally change the atmosphere of the world around you, allowing others to breathe in life and hope and future and peace and joy instead of fear and anguish and anxiety. When you choose to live free, you bring the presence of God everywhere you go. When you transform the room around you, it impacts those who are close to you. This is the ministry of a believer as we learn to walk free. The second, the second thing that we see in the life of David is so vital for our children, for our sons and our daughters. The next truth that I can say is as I learn to live free, I will create a new heritage for my family. The throne of Israel is still called the throne of David to this day. And God's promise was that David would always have a descendant on the throne. In Jeremiah 33, 17, he prophesies, For thus saith the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. What is the heritage that you give to your children? David was destined to be a farmer. He was destined to watch sheep and flocks until God anointed him to be king. And as he chose to pursue that, he transformed the destiny, just, not just of his own life, but a heritage for his entire family. What are the gifts that you will pass on for generations? What are the patterns? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? I think too many families have been plagued by generational curses, patterns of brokenness passed from father to son, mother to daughter. There's anger and pride. There's addictions, poverty, depression, sickness. Do you know, more than the list of things that might have been passed down to you, we need to know that in Christ we're a new creation, that the old is gone and every curse is broken. There's freedom in Jesus' name. So a better question to ask than what is the heritage that I've been given is what is the freedom I will win in Christ that I will pass to my children and to their children for generations to come? What are the victories that you will win today that while new for you would become normal for your children? You know, in the natural, my family would be known for a few things. Lots of kids, being tall and thin, I like that one. That unfortunately comes with big noses and flappy ears. You're welcome. But we'd be known for being hard workers, but probably also hard people. If I was like my dad before he knew Christ, I would be born with a temper and a short fuse. That would be my heritage. But do you know, because of my grandmother, my family lives out a new heritage today. You know, she was saved in an early Billy Graham crusade in Australia, and she became a woman of faith. And because of her prayers and because of her faith, my family has a different heritage. We're now people of faith and prayer. We're worshippers. We're preachers and pastors. We live with kindness and grace. What began with my grandmother and grew with my parents, will continue to expand through my life and my children. I believe there's going to be new freedom for my children that I will win in my time. My children will be bold and not timid. They'll be confident, not anxious. My children will be generous and not frugal because this is the heritage that I would pass on to them. What will your heritage be for your family? Will you pass on brokenness and dysfunction? Or will you choose to fight for and win freedom in Jesus Christ, learning to step into new patterns? Because the freedom you find today will become normal for your family tomorrow. Step into it, fight for it, win it, take hold of it in Jesus' name, because he has set you free.
Number three, we'll challenge you a little bit. I think and help you see the call to make a difference in, to be honest, whatever your sphere of influence is. It could be your family. It could be your workplace. It could be your sports club. It could be the friends that surround you. But we're called to make a difference in, directly in the lives of the people around us. Number three says, I will strengthen the people around me. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 to 2, it says, David departed from there and escaped into the cave of Adullam. He's been pursued by King Saul. And when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. You know, David at this point had been anointed to be king over Israel. He had defeated Goliath. He had demonstrated skill as a warrior and as a leader. And now the then anointed king of Israel, Saul, was literally trying to kill him. David is, is hiding for his, for his life in a cave. He's living in, the, in a pit of darkness and despair. His identity was under attack. His reputation was in tatters. He was being oppressed by authorities. He was living a life in exile. You know, it was at this time that he wrote Psalm 142. Let me read it for you quickly. David writes and he says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead to mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see there's no one who takes notice of me. There's no refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. David is in the midst of despair and he cries out, God, I put my trust in you. God, I'm looking to you. And God in his goodness and his faithfulness sent him the distressed, the in debt, the discontent. God surrounded him by people who were even worse off than he was. Thanks, God. <laughs> but in that situation, David chose to become their captain and their commander. <sighs> awesome job. What's, what's more amazing is that how these men are actually described later on in Scripture. They came in in debt, distressed, discontent, but later on they're described as David's mighty men. He took the distressed, he took the in debt, he took the discontent and he encouraged them. He equipped them for battle, he inspired them, he led them into victory. They themselves became known as mighty warriors, as heroes in the nation of Israel. Though surrounded by brokenness, David led them into freedom and significance. You know, it would have been so much easier for David. I mean, you saw his mental space. He's in a pit of despair. It would have been so much easier, having been surrounded by broken people, to sink further into their level. It would have been easier for him to actually start to identify with the people God placed around him. He could have agreed with who they thought they were. He could have affirmed what society said about them. He could have settled down to live a life of exile. But he didn't because he knew who he was. He knew who God had called him to be and he knew God's promises for the future. And so he took these men. He led them out of exile into freedom. I don't know who you're surrounded with right now. They might be champions. They might be less than champions. They could be the distressed or in debt. But here's what I do know. God has called you to be a leader unto righteousness, not a follower to destruction. At any point, David could have started to behave like just another man in exile, but he didn't. Even in the cave, he determined, I will live like a king. I will lead my people into freedom. What might God do through you as you start to see your call to live free? What would God start to do through you as you start to change the way you see the people in your workplace? as you start to change the way you see the friends that surround you? What might it look like for you to start challenging them to see themselves as more than the world has taught them as well? What might it, what might it look like as you start to encourage them, to call them higher, to train and equip them, to teach them what it is to be a person that follows after God? What might it look like as you start to strengthen them? 
What might it look like if you stopped living the way that the normal world has told you? What if you stopped living according to the world around you and started to lead according to the kingdom of God within you? That's what it means to live free. Could you start to see a workplace full of people set free from the lies of the enemy, from the burdens of the world, from the wounds of their past? Could you start to see a workplace full of people set free from the oppression of the enemy and living in the fullness and the abundance and the freedom that Jesus has won for them too? You could rewrite the entire culture and expectation of your workplace, of your friendship group, of the people close to you as you chose to see them as different and call them higher in the things of God. But it just begins with a simple decision that I will not live according to the people around me. I will live according to the Spirit of God within me. That can transform the world. Wherever you find people gathered around you, you could lead them to be mighty men and women of God. Number four is good because I get to go to a comfortable like Bible school story. We'll, we'll all picture it together. We'll have different ideas of what it looks like. But number four says that I will lead my people into victory. And we take this from the story of David fighting Goliath. But we need to understand what I see in this story is that when I find victory, when you find victory, we, you, can open the door for many to follow. Your victory will make a path that others can walk across. But before we get to David and Goliath, let me tell you the story of another man. Let me tell you the story of Roger Bannister. Until 1954, the whole world thought that it was impossible for anybody to run a mile in less than four minutes. Look at that rock star. Tall, thin, big nose, flappy ears. <laughs> he could be one of my people. Do you know many had tried? None had succeeded. But on May 6, 1954, Roger Bannister ran one mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. He did the impossible. What nobody believed could be done, he did. And you know, for years upon years, people had been trying to hit this goal. Nobody had achieved it. But having seen it, do you know that two months later, John Landy did exactly the same thing? And from that time on, more and more people have broken the four-minute mile barrier. Today, 1,664 athletes can run a mile in less than four minutes, which is incredible. Do you know it's now just considered the standard for a professional runner or middle distance runner? I can run a mile in less than four minutes. That's just what you have to do to get in the club. What used to be impossible is now normal and is the new standard for the way people look. All it took was one person to show that it could be done. There was a time in Israel's history where the entire army of Israel was being held captive by one man. Admittedly, he was a pretty big man. His name was Goliath. He was nine feet tall. He was six feet wide. He had a... No, read in the Bible. But every man of fighting age knew this simple fact. None of us can beat Goliath. Every man in the army of Israel knew we can't stand up against a giant. And because they knew that, they were already defeated. And that's how they lived. Until along came David... And although only a young man, he didn't think like the other people around him. He didn't know that Goliath was too big to fight. Instead, he knew that God was bigger. Let me read to you from 1 Samuel 17, 33 to 37. And King Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and I struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and I struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of those. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. You know, what you know to be true often depends on what you've experienced in your life. 
the rest of the army of Israel had experienced battle. They'd experienced defeat. And I think they'd probably even seen Goliath in action. <sighs> Would have been terrifying. They knew, I can't beat that man. But David had been living apart from them. He'd actually been living not as a soldier, but as a shepherd. And from his experience, he had seen God help him defeat a lion and defeat a bear. And so surely now my God would help me defeat this giant. And so he went out and threw stones at Goliath. And this is what happened next. If we read from verse 50 to 52. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from that place as far as Gath and Ekron. David's victory not only struck fear into the heart of his enemies, but it put courage into the heart of his people. Only one person had been defeated. But based upon that victory, the people of Israel rose up and pushed the enemy completely out of their lands. Your example, in the same way, could lead others into victory and freedom. Do you know your testimony, in the same way, can lead others into victim, victory and freedom? Amen. I want to ask you, what are the giants that would roam around this land that would not take not only your freedom, but the freedom of those that you love? You know, a giant can look like a lot of things. Some people battle giants of poverty, never having enough, of depression with joy being taken from every moment. There's divorce and domestic abuse, lust, anger, unforgiveness. Do you know the world needs to see the giant of unforgiveness defeated with his power taken? But this is the truth. You will find giants roaming this land, and they will try and take from you. But if you would learn to stand in freedom, as you would learn to stand not in your own strength, but in your heavenly fathers. Not only will you find victory, but you would become an example that would lead others into victory as well. Imagine a swell of people trampling over the work of the enemy as they learn to overcome unforgiveness and offense with the grace of God. Imagine a generation of Aussies that grew up without the, the giant of anxiety and depression walking across their land simply because you'd learn to take a stand today and I will defeat that enemy. Imagine what it would look like for these strongholds to be torn down and for people to walk around every day in freedom, in joy, in peace, living life an abundant life. Imagine that it began with you as you chose to stand and lead others into freedom in the strength of the Lord as you work out a mighty victory in Jesus Christ today because those that live free can lead others into freedom as well. God wants, you to, wants to use you to change the atmosphere around you. He wants to use you to encourage people. He wants to use you to lead others into freedom. He wants to completely change your, the future of your family and your loved ones, a new heritage. But also, point number five is just a question to ask, a question that leads beyond the here and the now and into the future. As you lived in freedom today, you could be a, genera a blessing for generations to follow. Not just the people here, but the people all across the world. Because David didn't only win victory for his nation. He didn't just leave a heritage for his children and his family line. Do you know that we today, the church, still pray his prayers? We still sing his songs? David's life overflowed in prayer and worship. And as he gave praise to God... And as he encouraged the people of God, he's still doing it today. I don't know what God might do through you. But I do know that it would go beyond what's happening just here and now. What might God do in your life and through your life that had an impact, not just for the people around you today, but for the generations to come? And not just for your family and friends, but for people of all nations and in far off lands. What could God do that would bring him glory, even in a thousand years' time? as you simply chose to live free. Why don't you ask him? Why don't you invite him to start to work in you? Why don't you choose that I'm going to live today, but not just for today, because my life will overflow 
to my friends, to my family, to my nation, to the whole world. Because I think this is the true legacy of those that walk in freedom. God's got so much in store for you. God has won freedom for you. He's promised you abundant life. Life to the full. And he invites those that know him to simply follow after him and step into everything that he has. In just a moment, I want to pr- close in prayer. I actually want to read a simple prayer from the, the book of Ephesians chapter 1, which is, is Paul praying for the believers of that church. So as I pray, would you stand with me? I want to read this prayer over us together. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present, but also in the one to come. Just a few verses later, he says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it was by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it's been grace that you have, by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Jesus Christ has won every victory. And today he invites us to be a church that lives in his victory. Not held captive by the world around us, not defined by the the lies of the enemy, but set free to live free. He invites us to pray. Father, let your will be done here on earth around us as it is in heaven. We're called to not only know the freedom of God, but to live in it and to lead others to it. So today I just want to pray that for every single person here today, we would not only know of the freedom of Christ, but we would learn to walk in it because the people in your life need you to live free. Your family needs you to live free. The world is changed and transformed as you learn to live free of what's normal today, free of what you've seen in the past, free of the powers that would roam this land, but standing in the strength and the life of Jesus Christ. Why don't you lift your hands to heaven? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have won freedom for us and life for us and hope for us and future. We invite you today just to continue to do a good work in our life, that you would lead us out of captivity and into freedom. Lord, that you would strengthen our life in your truth. Lord, that we would be set free of every lie of the enemy. We'd be set free of every condemnation. But Father, we would be called into your truth. Father, I thank you that you've given us a ministry to change the world around us, to bring your kingdom into this existence, Father. And Lord, I just pray that as we make ourselves available, Lord, would you help us to just change the world around us. Lord, that we'd bring your presence everywhere we go. Lord, that we'd lead people into your presence, that they would know you and find you. Father, that you would help us to see the people that you've placed in our life, that we would lead them unto righteousness. Lord, that you would give us a prophetic insight into their life that we call out the things of God in them, that we call out your strength and your grace and your mercy over their life. Lord, that we would call them out of darkness and into life. Father, I thank you that you've given us a new heritage in you. And Father, I break off today every generational curse, every lie that exists over families today that there will never be different. Father, I speak future. Lord, I thank you for new pathways into our families, new life in our families. Father, I thank you that you've called us to be like you and to be made in your image. So, Father, I speak the image of God over our families, that we would know your presence, that we would be worshippers. Father, we would be people of faith. 
Lord, that even as parents, we would begin to prophesy over our children that you will be as God called you to be. Lord, that you would help us to see and raise up, Lord, strength and capacity and ministry. Father, that the people in our world would be strengthened and become mighty because you've placed them around us. Lord, that we would lead unto righteousness today, that we would live according to your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we ask that as we simply make ourselves available, would you do exceedingly abundantly more through our life, that the world would see your glory. Lord, that the world would know your name. Lord, that you would do things in our lives that would transform not just our generation, but generations to come. Lord, give us a heart for the nations. Lord, that we would give our life to you, that you would use it for greater things. Thanks for joining us. We pray that you and your family are richly blessed by the love and grace of Jesus. If you're ever in the area, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship.